Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this evening's Artists and Inspiration program titled Taking the Temperature of the Arts in the Adirondacks. I'm David Kahn, the Executive Director of the Adirondack Experience. I'd like to begin this evening's program by acknowledging that the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. On July 1 of 2023, the Adirondack Experience will open a major new fabulous permanent exhibit featuring our incredible Adirondack art and decorative arts collections. The exhibit will be called Artists and Inspiration in the Wild. And it well inspired us to promote this or create this related program series that explores some of the topics that will be featured in the exhibit. Tonight, we are extremely honored to have as our panelists many of the remarkable people who lead the dynamic arts organizations in the Adirondacks, some of whom are accomplished artists as well. We have with us tonight, in alphabetical order because we don't play favorites here, George Cordes, Artistic Director of the Adirondack Lake Center for the Arts, here in Blue Mountain Lake, where the Adirondack Experience is located, just down the hill from us. Ed Donnelly, board member of Tupper Arts in Tupper Lake. Erica Blunt from Emerge 125, a dance company based in both Lake Placid and Harlem. Tony Kotstecki, general director of the Siegel Festival in Shroon Lake. James Lemons, executive director at the, at the Lake Placid Center for the Arts. Natalie Thill, executive director of the Adirondack Center for Writing based in Saranac Lake and Catherine Hill, Executive Director of VIEW Center for the Arts and Culture in Old Forge. And now I'm delighted to introduce a man who needs no introduction because we all hear his voice almost every day on NCPR. And that is NCPR Station Manager Mitch Tyke, who will be moderating this evening's discussion. Mitch rejoined NCPR in July 2019. He formerly served as a reporter there in the 1990s. Before returning to the North Country, he served as news director at Arizona Public Radio and worked for 14 years as executive producer and co-host of the daily interview program at Milwaukee Public Radio. Throughout this evening's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions you might have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And Mitch will do his best to get to all of the questions, but if we don't, we'll answer them uh, via email. So Mitch, take it away. Thank you so much, David. Uh, and thanks to all of you on the panel and who have joined us uh, on the internet uh, for being a part of this conversation. And I want to start by going around this virtual table in the order you appear on my screen anyway, uh, and by asking each of you to share a little bit about your organization in, say, 90 seconds or less, uh, and then have you each weigh in on a, a big question, which is where you see your group work in what is at least fragilely uh, the post-pandemic landscape. And uh, the order on my screen uh, has us starting with uh, Tony Kostecki. Oh gosh, going first. How fun. <laughs> uh, thanks for, thank, uh, thanks to, to the Adonic Experience for having me today. Uh, I am Tony Kostecki. I'm the general director of Siegel Festival in Scroon Lake. Uh, Siegel Festival is a hundred year old plus organization with kind of a dual purpose. Uh, outwardly, we produce opera and musical theater for the public. Uh, we have a nine week summer and a seven week fall season. Uh, our, other, our other function is that we are the oldest and one of the leading programs of summer vocal training in the United States. Uh, we're known in the music, uh, in the opera and musical theater industry, industry is, is one of the kind of top finishing schools for opera and musical theater performers. Um, our program offers our artists not only performing opportunities, but specific training and classes to prepare them for professional careers uh, and also opportunities to audition for next level companies while they're here in a residential kind of opera camp, as we like to call it, setting. Um, most of our artists are graduate students, are recent graduates of universities, conservatories across the country and the cusp of their professional careers. And our former artists are singing now on stages all around the world, uh, Broadway, musical theater companies, as well as opera companies uh, everywhere. 
Um, over the past 15 or 20 years, we've also turned some of our programmatic attention to cultivation of our art form by way of uh, new opera and musical theater workshops, premieres, and uh, new productions. So in answer to Mitch's question, where do we see ourselves coming out of the pandemic? Well, it's been a, a challenge uh, for us as, as it was for many arts programs, um, particularly, uh, you know, the, the obvious challenge was a public gathering during a pandemic, especially in a our theater, which is a 19th century barn, uh, converted barn with no ventilation or really any uh, kind of, uh, uh, filtration for the air, so that was a that was a challenge. Um, we met it, or we had we attempted to meet it by producing virtual and digital content. Uh, we streamed shows for one whole season, um, and I think as we're moving out of that, our challenge now is kind of re-engaging audiences that have kind of forgotten or gotten out of the habit of attending performances. Um, and also reaching out to all those new folks that have uh, come to the Adirondacks uh, during the pandemic um, and making sure they know that we're here and can enrich their lives and all that kind of stuff. And I think the other thing that um, has been a an opportunity for us during uh, during the past couple of years uh, is the the reckoning, I think, in our in the opera and musical theater field anyway, of the inequities and kind of way things have always been done uh, situations um, and you know the time that we had to reflect as an industry during the pandemic um, uh, has taken has taken some uh, had made has made us take some some changes in the way we do our training and we do our performing um, so that's uh, something that we're continuing to work on but uh, looking forward to finding out the ways or figuring out the ways that we can be a better company and serve all those constituencies in this post pandemic time. Uh, great, Tony, thank you so much. Uh, going around the, uh, the the Zoom room here uh, to uh, to my right anyway, I see uh, Natalie Phil of the Adirondack Center for Writing. Hello, it's nice to see all of you here. Thank you so much for including me. Yes, I direct the Adirondack Center for Writing. Um, I'm the executive director, and we're a region-wide organization, but we are based in Saranac Lake. And our mission is we inspire a love of writing, reading, and storytelling. And we do that by putting people and words together <laughs> in just meaningful ways. Um, and we're a program-heavy organization, and we do some things that you would expect, like writing workshops and programs for teens and um, readings with both regional and um, acclaimed national authors. Um, we do a Howl Story Slam with Mitch at NCPR, but we also do a lot of innovative programming to try to um, broaden our audience as, as much as possible. So we do things like spray paint poems on sidewalks that you can only see in the rain, or we bring poets into hardware stores and drop poems there or in cafeterias, or we just try to engage the population so that um, there's less of a the disconnect between um, the passion for writing and for crafted language and where they live and breathe and do their work and, and spend their time. Um, we also have a very deep um, and long history doing prison work. Um, we've had a prison writing program in the men's federal prison since 2002. Um, and we've also done a lot of work in the state facility. And we work with a lot of different populations, everything from we've been we have a teen writing lounge in our brand new space. Um, we've worked with vets, we've worked with people suffering from addiction and trauma, you know, and using writing as a means of, um, you know, uh, processing difficult uh, feelings and emotions, as well as learning to use it as a crafted means of expression. So both of those kind of pillars. And that sort of segment weighs me into the whole question of COVID. Um, <clears throat> after the initial terror <laughs> of COVID and whether or not we were going to survive, um, I really found, and I, I think a lot of my colleagues here will, will agree, that people really learned to lean on the arts um, during COVID. Um, they realized that 
the arts were going to help them through the stress of what was happening. But also, I think that sometimes people had time. So it's like, oh, I finally am going to write this piece that I've always wanted to write. Um, so as awful as it is to say, we really came out of COVID stronger um, than we've ever been. We now have a really big space. We have, um, we're looking to hire um, a third person. We're um, broadening our space. Um, we're having a larger reach, um, which isn't to say we don't have challenges, of course, and it's the same challenges we've all um, experienced. But I think that there's a really big shift that a lot of people, and including donors, Owners were reevaluating their priorities um, during COVID and they were realizing how important the arts were. Um, and it was a real time of connection. You know, I mean, people would just email just because they wanted to talk <laughs> you know, and just, you know, I never told you how much your, your programs mean to me, but now I have the time I'm going to do that. Um, and so there was a lot of really scary things that happened, but there were a lot of really beautiful moments too. And um, I feel like we came out of it um, a lot stronger. Um, and there are things, you know, for example, I want to hire someone and there's a huge labor shortage. So like, it's one of these kind of strange and where would they live, Mitch? Where would they live if I could hire them? Um, so there are such a changed uh, dynamic, um, but I do feel very strongly that um, the arts were so important in people's lives during COVID and, you know, these years, I don't know, do we use past or present tense to, right. to describe it? Um, so I feel really lucky that myself and all the colleagues here that we were here um, for our audiences. You're asking me where they live as though I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> yeah. If you could get on that and just uh, get me some... Give me some housing. I suspect we might talk a little bit about uh, about uh, housing as an issue that faces uh, the arts community, in addition to everyone else, a little bit later in the program. But I want to move along to Erica Blunt and have you tell us a little bit about Emerge 125 and uh, uh, and also where you see the organization coming out of uh, coming out of the pandemic. Thank you, Mitch. Um, one, I want to say I'm here on behalf of Tiffany Ray Fisher. She's our executive artistic director, um, and she's under the weather. So um, just wanted to, she is really excited about um, letting people know the work that we do here. Um, so Emerge 125 is a Black female-led uh, dance uh, hub for dance performance creation and education. So one of the um, biggest things is that we're housed duly homed both in uh, Harlem and Lake Placid. And one of the biggest uh, pushes that Tiffany has is she wants that for modern dance to be accessible. And that means both accessible by location, accessible by medium, accessible by how, what we discuss. And over the pandemic, um, obviously like many other people, we couldn't perform. Um, you know, in closed spaces. So uh, looking into different mediums like doing film, like uh, having town halls about the things that matter to us, including being civically engaged, you know, not necessarily being specifically a performance or a, um, a class or a rehearsal, but as artists, how can we engage and, and discuss with one another um, what it means to be of this time because as artists we do reflect the time so I think uh in COVID it's been really wonderful to explore all to have the time as we discussed to have the time to be able to slow down and discuss those things and also having some time to create um artists a lot of times have to push to to create quickly over time so um what we really want to do and what Tiffany's really um excited about is to continue to uh, serve the community um, and, and continue to make sure that people have access to high quality art and high qual quality um, uh, dance and dance education. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep it short for you, Mitch, um, <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, that's really what we're here to do and want people to be excited about that. Great, and thank you so much for, for pinch hitting and uh, being part of the conversation today. <sighs> 
moving along now, uh, James Lennons, uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, I imagine a lot of people are familiar with the Lake Placid Center for the Arts, but uh, but give us a thumbnail sketch and um, and also uh, tell us where you see um, the organization coming out of COVID. Thanks, Mitch, and thanks, everyone. It's so good to see everyone's faces. I'm James Lemons. I'm the executive director of the Lake Placid Center for the Arts. We are a 50-year-old community art center located in uh, beautiful Lake Placid. Uh, we do our work primarily through four different pillars. Uh, we do have the performing arts series, perhaps the thing that we are most known for, uh, but we also have a heavy visual arts program with two galleries, one on our campus and one in downtown Lake Placid. Uh, an arts education program that does everything from school day performances that the kids that come in for field trips to art camps to uh, all kinds of uh, residency and after school workshops. Uh, and a fourth pillar uh, on this sheet called Nonprofit Partners that has been recently renamed to services to artists and organizations, uh, which includes work with uh, our partner organizations that live with us on campus, as well as many of the people on this call today uh, through collaborative services. You know, coming out of the, the pandemic, uh, to echo a bit what Natalie was saying earlier, for us, the pandemic forced us to reevaluate how we prioritized internally those four pillars and really assess if we were giving enough attention to each of those pillars. You know, what was surprising to us is that, you know, when the pandemic happened and that performing arts presenting pillar was eliminated really for years, um, the other pillars actually flexed enough to grow so that two of the three pillars of the organization increased their amplitude and increased their impact in the community while that one pillar was, was inactive. So, now that we're able to act actually activate all four pillars in a real way, it really makes us be uh, intentional about which pillar is getting most attention when, what time of the year, and how we um, um, allocate the internal resources of both finances and time from our from a staff perspective, and really um, grow. You know, the other thing we I think came out of the pandemic thinking is that that services to artists and organizations, how can we as an organization provide service to the community, both the nonprofit community and the arts patrons community, uh, and really in some ways change the way that we think about how we do our work so that we're an arts organization, but we're also a service organization that uses the arts to provide service to people. Uh, so I'll, Mitch, I'll keep it brief and throw it back to you. I appreciate that. And uh, although I, I have a quick follow up question, not to be, a, you know, glasses half full uh, kind of person here. Um, but uh, would you say that this kind of intro was it a luxury luxuries may be the wrong word, but it sounds like uh, the pandemic at its height allowed you to be introspective in a way that you might not have been able to set aside time to to accomplish? Oh, 100% complete. You know, I call it the hamster wheel. We as an organization have are notoriously on that hamster wheel, always running as fast as we can for what is immediately in front of us. You know, we're like everyone, we're a nonprofit organization that relies on the generosity of our friends and donors to pay our bills and to pay our artists. And a lot of time we're moving so fast to keep the wheel spinning uh, and use that funding responsibly that we actually don't have time to step off this that wheel and reflect. And the pandemic forced the wheel to stop. It was like a hand came in and just grabbed it and forced it to stop. And so we actually had time to think through in a really thoughtful manner, um, you know, what we wanted to be and how we wanted to do the things that we we're supposed to do. And, and it was a luxury was probably not, you know, it, it was a terrifying luxury. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I want to go now to uh, George Cordes and uh, have him weigh in on his organization um and uh, and also uh on where things stand for uh, the uh uh sorry i the adirondack lakes, adirondack lakes. I was, yeah no i was i was yeah, I, I was checking to make sure that there was an s at the end of lakes uh so uh for thank you. the adirondacks lake uh center <laughs> for the arts <laughs> yes yes thank you mitch yes it's adirondack lakes plural 
um, which we're very proud of. I mean, it, you know, signifying that we represent more than our beautiful little hamlet of Blue Mountain Lake, where uh, we have been since 1967, going on our 55th year. Um, as, as, uh, and as David mentioned, we're just down the hill from the Adirondack Experience. Um, and thank you also to the Adirondack Experience for, for hosting this. This is great to have this round table and you know, bringing all, these, all of my colleagues together and uh, so we can discuss uh, what we've got going on. Um, yeah, we are, we are multidisciplinary art center in, in Blue Mountain Lake. We are seasonal, so we're currently closed. Uh, this picture behind me uh, was taken in another winter, so we, the icicles aren't quite that, that uh, long. But, um, and and we, uh, we are a presenter and a producer. Of, uh, of the arts. So we have gallery shows every year. We have um, lectures and workshops and kids um, activities. We also do um, two forms of performance. We have a concert series um, and also uh, in, in which we try to present a, a wide variety, a wide spectrum of music, uh, everywhere from classical to jazz to folk to alternative to um, dot, dot, dot. Um, we also uh, have our, we're very proud of our Adirondack Lake Summer Theater Festival, which we've been doing for a number of years now. And, um, and so we, uh, we have three productions that we tour around uh, the Adirondacks uh, with, with, that, uh, with that programming, um, which would be a straight play, uh, our Shakespeare in the Parks, which is free, uh, an abridged uh, play, Shakespeare play every year that we bring to various towns around the area. And also our musical theater production, which we also tour. So, uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, this, these kinds of activities were curtailed and actually, uh, you know, we, you know, that, that lovely word pivot, we definitely did that in 2020, like everybody else. Uh, we pivoted to uh, virtual, uh, also, my, my background is um, uh, prior to being artistic general director of the uh, Arts Center, uh, I've had a 30 year career as a performer, opera, a musical theater. I'm a singer, an actor. And, and, uh, and so I, you know, I have that background. And, um, and so when, when 2020 happened, I have so many colleagues, so many friends uh, who who um, you know were were impacted by that, and um, so a big a big part of what what we've been trying to do uh, since then we've been coming back slowly. In 2020, we created a, a virtual series, our Alka Seltzer series, uh, which uh, we we got a lot of different people to to contribute to. I you know I got all my my skill level up with. Uh, with streaming and, and video and all of that. And, and uh, that's still available to, to access and to watch and enjoy. Um, also, we have, uh, you know, that, that also kind of, as, as James said, you know, you, you and, Co and Tony, you know, you reevaluate your priorities. You, you figure out what, if, what's your organization about? You know, what are your priorities? What do you want to do? You know, what, what, what is your mission? You know, it, it forces you to re-examine your mission, which is to be connected and to provide the arts, which, uh, you know, has, has been crucial. It was crucial during, especially during the pandemic, um, because it's just so important to, to people's uh, lives. Uh, you know, it's important to mental health, that kind of thing. And, and, and so that, that has been a, a good thing that's come out of it. We, we continue to, uh, we've, we've used that, uh, that kind of virtual and that technology to, uh, to continue to uh, tweak and adjust our programming. We, we came back from our virtual programming to a, a kind of a reduced uh, season in 2021. Uh, we did bring back live performance, but it was touch and go. It was, every, you know, you never knew from, from day to day, week to week, uh, you know, what, what the, the rules and restrictions were gonna be. So uh, we, you know, we, we got through that season 
without mishap and we, we, we were very proud of what, what we accomplished. This year, it's been even more, it's been you know, back to life, uh, live programming um, with all the elements that I mentioned. And, um, and, and next year we're, we're looking uh, to do even more. Um, so, you know, we are, we are kind of a, a hub here in, in, in Blue Mountain Lake, but also we, we feel a responsibility to be, uh, to be connecting all of our little communities around this area, you know, and, and the arts is, is one of those elements that, that can be kind of lacking in, in, in the, uh, the cultural lives of, of, of some of our the folks, especially in rural areas, you know, so we, we feel a great responsibility to, to continue to do that and to be, uh, you know, one of, one of my great joys was, was putting people back to work saying, you know, I know you, you, you lost all of your, all your gigs, but here you go, we can hire you to do this and this and this. And, you know, you got a little, little bit of income and, you know, please join us. And, and I, so I, I'm very proud of that, that accomplishment. Fantastic. Uh, we have two more people that, and, and organizations we want to hear about uh, before we go down uh, some of the paths that all of you have kind of touched on already. But, uh, but let's hear now from Ed Donnelly of Tupper Arts. Tell us a little bit about Tupper Arts and uh, what you faced during the pandemic. And, you know, we should note that the, the pandemic is not over. It's, it's sort of in a different phase at this point. Uh, but uh, in this sort of fragile recovery we have, where do you see Tupper Arts? Uh, thanks for having us, and thanks, Adirondack Experience, for uh, putting on this roundtable. Tupper, Tupper Arts is a fairly new organization, but the arts in uh, Tupper Lake has a long tradition. In fact, this coming summer will be the 50th uh, Tupper Lake Community Art Show that we'll be holding. We're going to make a big deal of that. But over the years, there have been several uh, dedicated groups that have showcased the art artistic talents in the community. And in 2018, a new group group took up the challenge and incorporated Tupper Arts as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we're dedicated to nurturing the arts in the community life in Tupper Arts in the regional area. In 2021, Tupper Arts reached a major milestone by purchasing its current home of a 10,000 square foot former furniture store in the heart of the business district. In 2022, we did our, completed our first capital uh, improvements by replacing the entire front of the building, which you can see in the photograph here. It's mostly all glass now, which highlights all the beautiful art that we have available for people to come in and see and buy. Uh, and the good news continues. A couple of weeks ago, the governor of New York announced that Tupper Lake, Tupper Arts, I'm sorry, was awarded a downtown revitalization initiative grant of nearly $700,000. Uh, the funds will continue to be used to renovate this building and to renovate the Adirondack State Theater that is directly adjacent to our building. Effort, efforts are currently underway uh, for Tupper Arts to purchase the 108-year-old historic building. And our goal is to keep it as a cinema, uh, showing, you know, first-run Hollywood movies, in addition to renovating the inside of the theater to, to allow live performances year-round. Uh, and also, our, our organization is open year-round. Our board of directors is a working board of directors. Uh, we're constantly working on our programming. Uh, in addition to that, to the visual arts that we uh, do, we're, we're very focused on children's programming, and that includes dance, education, and uh, entertainment opportunities for the area kids. Uh, in cooperation with the village of Tupper Lake, uh, Tupper Arts, manages and books weekly musical performances at the new amphitheater on the shores of Flanders Park. And if anybody hasn't been to it, the sunsets are beautiful during these performances. And that just scratches the surface of some of the things we're up to. As far as COVID goes, yes, we, uh, like everybody else, were affected. We were shut down. 
uh, for a good period of time. Fortunately, since and as of this past June, we hired our first part-time employee. But prior to that, we were all volunteers. So we had no payroll to worry about. So we were able to get through the worst part of the pandemic without too much problem. We were closed, uh, but when we were allowed to open, uh, we opened our windows and doors, implemented all the uh, COVID protocols that were required and continued to see people come in. And one of the surprising things, I think for most of us up here in the Adirondacks is the volume of people that came out of the cities to visit this beautiful area up here. So we actually saw more visitors due to the pandemic as opposed to what we thought would happen. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, we have one more Mitch, person. Oh yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm sorry, I, I forgot. I forgot one very <laughs> important element of, of what we do, and I. <laughs> Um, we, we also, the Arts Center is also um, a coordinator of the statewide community regrants program for, for NISCA for the uh, Quad Counties area. That's a very, very, very important part of what we do. And so that helps us get, uh, get money out. To, it's Hamilton, Franklin, Clinton, and Essex County. So I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> I, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody on our staff is, is, you know, realizes <laughs> I did not forget that important. Moment. <laughs> uh, well, we have a we have a panel of uh, seven very distinguished uh, arts leaders, and uh, Catherine Underhill, you are uh, relatively new to this uh, to this at least this part of the art world. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about your role at uh, the View Center and uh, what you're able to share about where you see view in the in the days uh, coming out of um, the worst of the pandemic. Sure, and thank you again to um, the panelists and to Adirondack Experience for bringing us together. Uh, it, I am the newest member of this happy team. Uh, <laughs> I've only been at view since the beginning of July. And I've been so impressed with what a beautiful and highly effective organization it is. Um, if you haven't visited, VIEW is located in Old Forge. It's a 20,000 square foot multidisciplinary art center, really a little jewel. It's actually been around as an organization for more than 70 years, uh, but moved into its current building in 2011. And the building was intentionally designed to be very eco-friendly. It's a LEED silver certified building. We have four beautiful exhibition spaces, a 200 seat flexible performance and multi-use space uh, with a fully sprung floor. So love to talk to um, Erica about some dance. Um, we present music and spoken word. We collaborate with Alka on that. And James and I have been talking about how can we block books. So a lot of opportunity there for partnership. Uh, we also have a wonderful workshop space, a full catering kitchen, and um, a beautiful pottery studio with uh, lots of hand building space, 10 wheels, three kilns, lots of opportunities. Um, we just opened last Friday four new exhibitions, all related to uh, the botanical world in and around the Adirondacks. So the largest is called Flowers, Trees, and Roots. And this is uh, what you see on screen is one of the pieces from that show. It's multimedia. It was a nationwide juried exhibition. So there's about 80 artists represented there. We also have a collaborating organization or exhibition uh, of botanical illustration. And we have a beautiful and very unusual um, wood exhibition that is uh, featuring the work of a single artist from, his name is Jack Elliott. He's a faculty member at Cornell and he works in found wood, uh, wood that's been uh, stricken with disease or fallen over in the forest or taken out for construction. Um, it's been a really interesting time actually since COVID. I think uh, the organization has been thinking hard about who it serves. And I know that's been a thread in everyone's comments. So we are really trying to position ourselves 
as a because we are year round, we're able to serve uh, both year round residents in the region and summer or seasonal residents in the region and visitors to the area, some of whom stumble upon view and some of whom come intentionally. And uh, I think traditionally the organization has been relatively quiet in the off season. And so we're really trying to build on the foundational work of the exhibitions, which really is kind of the primary, the center of the organization uh, and build more programming around that in the off season. And I believe that has grown out of COVID because there was such a, um, a demand for opportunities to be engaged with the arts. And like all of you, we also pivoted, offered a lot of virtual programming, um, spoken word performances, gallery talks. We're still doing a lot of that. In fact, on Thursday of this week, we'll be offering a gallery talk with the jurors for the two national juried exhibitions. So we'll have three artists talking about how they selected the work that is currently on display. Um, and we're, we are, doing more performances. There'll be more um, films in our space. Uh, we're doing a panel on forestry and invasive species. And in, then in the summertime is really when VIEW is cooking. So I hope that if you haven't had a chance to visit, you'll come and uh, we have a beautiful craft festival. We have a lovely antique show. Uh, we have our, uh, we will actually be featuring a a large exhibition about water in the summertime, which is uh, going to involve a lot of different partnerships and opportunities to work with lots of different organizations. And we have our, um, our most well-known is probably the Adirondack National Exhibition of American Watercolors, which uh, actually, and this is a poster right behind <laughs> me from that, coincidentally. And uh, so I hope that people will come and visit and participate in the programming that uh, connects with all of those exhibitions. Uh, fantastic. Um, and, and along those lines, I mean, I think, uh, you know, North Country Public Radio is, is its own kind of arts organization in some ways. We think a lot about the audience that we serve, whether it's just the people who are uh, listening to us on the radio or somebody in California or the Netherlands or wherever who's listening um, to us through their app or a smart speaker. There's been a lot of reporting about the influx of people to the Adirondacks from other parts of the state, other parts of the country who can take the chance to work remotely and take advantage at the same time of the quality of life here. What do you see, and, and I'll throw this open to, to anyone, what do you see as the opportunities that the new population uh, might offer? And what are, the, what are the challenges in serving um, people who don't necessarily have uh, the same long ties to the region. Maybe I'll throw it to uh, Catherine Underhill. You have oh, your hand raised. <laughs> I do. There you go. We've all learned how to uh, navigate <laughs> Zoom, right? It's interesting for me because, you know, as the new person in the area, I do think one of our, for view anyway, one of our greatest challenges is uh, introducing ourselves to people who are not familiar with us. How do people find out about us? And with a lot of new visitors and residents in the area, I think that that, that poses an opportunity and a challenge. Um, we're trying to get better at using social media. Uh, our website is about to be completely redesigned, which I think will be enormously helpful. Um, and I, I think collaboration and partnership is probably part of that as well. So I'm hoping that there will be opportunities in the future to think about um, cross-fertilization in our marketing efforts, linking with one another to provide maybe some benefit if you're a member of um, Lake Placid Center for the Arts, then you can come to view and get a discount on a class or you know, just opportunities to try to build more awareness of the whole ecosystem that exists in the Adirondacks. Are any of you seeing the, the evidence of uh, people coming for a new life here and uh, wanting to be involved in the, the either in the arts community at large or your individual organizations? 
I see people nodding and I see people shaking their head. So it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll throw it to, uh, to Erica. Um, you know, are people surprised when they, uh, when they move here and find out there is a dance troupe like Emerge 125? Uh, I think they, well, one, the company has been coming up uh, for 30 years and under a different name. We've done some rebranding and some renaming. So there is some um, familiarity and Tiffany uh, has been coming up for 20 years. I think we've been in so many different spaces now that that's been um, really wonderful. So we partnered with Lake Class Center for the Arts, we partnered with John Brown Live, we partnered with the Adirondack Experience, we partnered with the Wild Center and done like outdoor performances. So I think uh, more so not just being surprised that there's dance here because there's a history of dance uh, uh, specifically in Lake Placid, but I think also like bringing dance to places that people would not necessarily um, be think that it would be uh, there when they got there. So I think that's what the surprise has been like, oh, we're, you know, we're doing stick works, um, we're doing fall fest, we're, you know, we're doing all of these different things that I think interest people that they don't have to just go to a dance show, that they can have an experience and get dance be there. Do others on the panel have thoughts uh, along the lines of how uh, a new population might be experiencing the arts here? <laughs> Ed Donnelly? Yeah, we were actually very surprised with the influx of new people and with new people coming into the area. It's it's new energy. It's new blood um, that these folks are looking uh, for things like the arts and to do up here. And I think many are surprised of of the rich arts up up in this area and the beauty of the area. And it is translating into volunteers at our organization and people coming forward willing to to help uh, promote things within our organization and like I said I think the new folks coming in have provided that new new surge of energy in fact a good part of our board are new trans I guess we we're called transplants up here <laughs> And it's it's the new energy and the excitement of of the beauty of the Adirondacks, and people are seeing that. And I really think the uh, the the pandemic actually promoted the area up here. It's it's truly been quite amazing. So I guess the question is, how do you tap into that and keep it going? And that's what we're all working towards. Well, and uh, and James Lemons, do you have uh, do you have thoughts along those lines? You know, for me, at least in, in, in the Placid region, it's it's a question of amount of service and expectation of transplanted visitors. So when we look at the, the roles of who's moving to the area and where they're coming from, they're coming from environments where the cultural opportunities are vast and they have options. Uh, and you move to the Adirondack region and just the sheer volume of what you have available to participate in is very much more limited. And even those of us on the call, you know, can attest to just the financial dynamics of making it possible to present the work means that we can't produce, present something or produce something every weekend. So, you know, keeping newer audiences who, and newer people to the region who are interested in arts and culture engaged in making sure they're checking out all the organizations and not relying on one will i think is one of the only ways to keep them interested in arts and culture because we have to keep them going to the field not just to any one of our particular organizations because because we need to keep them engaged and keep everyone moving forward uh just because if they're just going to my organization or if they're just going to Natalie for, for stuff, we just, we don't have the, the bandwidth to produce and present that amount of programming in any given month, six month period, however long we're looking at. So, so it's about, you know, collaborative opportunities to really make sure there's engagement at all times. Well, and I wonder, and, and George Cordes, maybe you, you want to take a crack at this. Um, you know, when I look at the the seven of you, you're all from different organizations. It it feels more like you're complementary to each other in uh, serving the public versus 
being competitors. If, if we were having this conversation in Boston or New York, um, not that people wouldn't be collegial, but, uh, but it sounds to me like, uh, what, uh, what James was saying, um, that, uh, that because you know, talking economies of scale here, because the organizations are smaller, um, maybe there's not the same pressure to produce every weekend because another organization might be producing. But uh, but George uh, George Cordes, what would you have to say about um, how the uh, how the new residents of the Adirondacks are defining what you're all about? Yeah, well, to uh, to build on what's been said already, I mean. The Arts Center, actually, our programming pre-COVID was already kind of set up uh, for this kind of collaboration, for, for this, this kind of uh, interaction with other organizations, with, our, you know, with, with the arts, um, especially our, our performance programming, because um, not only with our theater festival, as a producer, we have been bringing our productions to places like VIEW and Tannery Pond and, and you know, LPCA and, and various schools around that, and various communities. I mean, just all kinds of venues around the Adirondacks. So we've already kind of been in the process of that, uh, you know, that collaboration and partnership, which uh, we definitely want to continue to be building on. Um, I, and also we've, we've kind of set ourselves up um, to, to be serving whatever population is out there. I mean, you know, we are a seasonal art center. We're closed during the winter. And so, you know, our programming really is pretty intense. Once we, we you know, get, get going in, in May or, you know, it, it's, it's changed a little bit each, uh, each year, but uh, basically it's, it's gonna be again from Memorial Day through uh, Columbus slash Indigenous People's Day, and um, and so during that period of time, we we do actually have a lot. We have something going on pretty much every weekend. Um, but that being said, a lot of it our, our touring productions, you know, are going elsewhere, not necessarily in our in our space. Um, but um, but again, as, as everyone's saying, you know, we are we are kind of limited in terms of our size, in terms of the number of st staff we have, obviously, uh, in terms of our, our uh, financial um, capabilities. So we, we do what we can. I, I think we do a great job with with what we're with what we, we do financially. But um, but that being said, yeah, partnerships are crucial. I mean, we've we we're very proud of, of having uh, been partnering a lot with, for example, uh, Indian Lake Theater over the years, um, you know, right down the road from us, using them as a, as a performance space and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and also bringing in programs like uh, the, the wonderful Siegel Festival program that, I, that we, we brought every year that, that I think we've been able to for the past number of years and, uh, and, and Pendragon Theater uh, and and other other programs that uh, uh, that it's this is very important for what we do. So I, I think to answer your question in terms of of bringing in more people, whoever's coming in, obviously part of that emphasis also is on diversity as well. And so that's that's a big um, objective of ours as well. Uh, we we have also been bringing uh, you know serving a more diverse. Uh, audience, I think, through our programming, but also I, I make it uh, imperative to be to be bringing in a diverse uh, array of performers, you know, and, and directors and other other people that we work with at, at the Art Center in our programming. So, I, you know, we're and we're set up marketing wise and, and all of that, but it will involve and require a lot, a lot of collaboration with other arts organizations going forward. Uh, Tony Kostecki, uh, George just mentioned uh, the Siegel Festival. How are the the region's newest residents shaping uh, your organization, if at all? Yeah, I, oh, definitely they are. I, I'll, I'll jump off a little, a little what James uh, said. So I think you know so a lot of the new residents in the region are from areas. Not only are they do they have a much uh, wider way or more more to choose from, but it's all very uh, you know you can go from a theater on to the next block to another theater, you know, and here in the Adirondacks, not only are, is one of our challenges is not only that we can't offer as much, but that the stuff is, you know, a 45 minute drive away. Um, 
So I, I, I work, I also am a, a, a board member for the Essex County Arts Council. And even with just within Essex County, which of course is a big county, but it's not the entire park, um, trying to find a way, and I, I'm not giving a solution because I don't have one quite yet, but trying to figure out a way to get the word out about all the amazing amount of art that's happening in even just in Essex County in some kind of coordinated way so that those res those new residents in in you know in all of our towns know that you know they can go they can spend a weekend in any little village in 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 the Adirondacks and get some kind of art experience and getting that word out um, and again jumping off what everyone else is saying collaborating somehow to to cross promote or uh, help you know help people understand that there are a lot of things here it's different it's a different scenario than living in a city but it's but there's a lot there's a lot happening so that's a, I think a challenge for all of us with the with the new folks um somebody actually uh commented uh using the Q&A and I'll uh I'll remind uh, folks who are uh are with us today that uh if you have questions uh feel feel free to put them in the Q&A and I will uh be happy to relay them. Uh, in fact, someone said it would be helpful to have a centralized website for the weekly uh, or monthly calendar of regional events. How big an issue is that coordination piece? The, uh, you know, is the uh, is the arts world siloed to some degree in the Adirondacks? Maybe Natalie, Phil, do you want to weigh in on that? I'm laughing because the problem is that there's too many calendars there's so many calendars <laughs> <laughs> that you don't know which one to do and there, there just needs to be one calendar and and then everyone wants it to be their calendar and um honestly it's 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 that's the issue there's just too many um i would suggest ncpr has got a really good calendar you can just use that one um you know and then but they're they're just james right they're there's just too many and um we try to hit all of them but um and then there's each town has a website there there's just too much um to collaborate you know but in some ways there's there's also the the problem of um you know having so many events on one day and blah 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 but i actually think that's beautiful i i love that there's so much happening that there is no way to have an event that's not going to be in conflict with another event um for all of you that have been doing it for a long time you remember like <laughs> remember uh let's see april to november you could you could schedule anything in and and you would be the only one in town in the area and there was, you know, some comfort in that a little bit, but it was also just this, you know, echo in the in the void. Um, and now year round, it's just all the time, all these things happening. And I think it's beautiful. And I oh, have always said, you know, you can't be, you can't have an art scene if you're the only one doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so to have lots of people doing lots of different programming and to 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 support and uh, partner with each other just just makes it all really worthwhile. Um, it's the only way Adirondack Center for Writing has existed. Um, we're a small organization. We serve the whole region. Um, I have partnered with most of you on um, this, Eric. I'm looking at you though, haven't I? <laughs> um, but you know, Catherine, I have a part with a view multiple multiple times. You just haven't been there. Um, and uh as well as like for profits and ski chalets. I mean, there's just there's just this gorgeous tapestry, um, I think, and opportunities to to uh to to collaborate and and to think outside the box and all of that. But the the issue of the calendar, I saw that in the Q and A, and I just started laughing because that's actually the problem is that there's just too many. <laughs> I appreciate the plug for the uh, NCPR community calendar, though. Oh, wait. <laughs> I think it's ncpr.org/calendar. Um, there's been a lot of reporting um, about some other issues that frame the narrative in the Adirondacks in 2022, um, including uh, access to childcare, transportation, uh, high-speed data connectivity, diversity, affordable housing, and others. Do you think the arts community is especially affected by any one of those issues? Erica, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a uh, a thought on that? I yes and, and no. I think um, you know 
it is it's everything like it's a little bit of everything um like when we first started well when I, i'll speak for myself i started coming up in 2018 2019 um and you know my cell phone didn't work so it's just like i can't even share the experience that i'm having here um and i think the simple things and like especially going virtually just the demand we um taught uh, both our summer uh, in, uh, dance intensive where we bring students from around the country to train for two weeks. Um, our dance school like rehearsal, everything went virtual. Um, and you know, Zoom has optimized itself, but in those beginning stages, um, it's, it took a lot of bandwidth and having multiple you know, devices trying to do the same thing, it was just difficult. Um, and, you know, you know, even for us, as we try to um, figure out, we have two teachers who come up uh, every week to teach at our school and it's, it, you know, making sure that they're housed and they have, uh, we have a, not just city kids, but, you know, just driving transportation, <laughs> you know, it is, it's, it's, it's part of it. Um, and, and, you know, making sure how we schedule so that they can commute and all of those things. And it's, there's there's lots of little things and I in my experience has uh, obviously been a much shorter sample uh, for, than the other people in this call but it, it it is a now I know when I come up here and now I know when I'm doing certain things but it I think in that time I've also seen improvement in in all of those areas so it's it's a it's a bit of it's a bit of everything for sure. What about others? Are you uh, are you experiencing some of these issues? I, I suspect, uh, Catherine Underhill, you might have some words about uh, about housing in the Adirondacks. <laughs> well, I'm sure others would agree with this too. It just happens that I am experiencing this myself, um, being new to the area and uh, seeking housing in the area. It's been a tough road to hoe. Uh, I think you know everyone probably would agree there is a housing shortage and. The cost of housing has increased substantially um, in part as a consequence of COVID. I, I think that's part of it. It also, coincidentally, I, I have hired several people. VU is kind of undergoing a transition just, you know, as a normal part of its evolution. And I know that um, I made some offers to people and they were scared off. They, they were not confident that they could find an affordable place to live. And that caused them to, you know, choose a different opportunity. So I think it's it's tough, not just for the arts, but I'm sure any all the businesses that are here, everybody that's trying to hire, we all know restaurants and and bars and hospitality that is suffering as well. So I I'm hopeful because there it is such a high profile issue that we'll see some creative solutions emerge and. I know that there's some interesting conversations taking place in our neck of the woods. I'd be interested to know what else is being done to tackle the issue elsewhere. Yeah, I'm curious uh, if anybody else on the panel has uh, has had that experience in trying to hire someone and people just not being able to uh, to take a job because uh, they either can't afford to live there or they haven't found any place to live. James Lemons, you're nodding. <laughs> And you're muted. <laughs> yeah, you would, think, you would think this long into the pandemic, I would know how to unmute before I uh, on call. <laughs> um, yeah, housing, yes, I think we can all agree housing housing is a terrible situation. Um, uh, you know, I have nine full time staff members in like at the Lake Placid Center for the Arts. No one lives in Lake Placid. Um, everyone lives in the surrounding community because of the cost of housing. But but I have a really weird, different response to, to the, uh, for me at least in my organization which is the biggest challenge facing the organization post pandemic is antiquated zoning laws and ordinances within our own communities because i think that actually affects housing it affects commercial development there's no mixed use there's weird like height restrictions on new builds which doesn't allow for mixed use you know retail and commercial uh facilities so i think that that our small tiny towns that were built as destination resort locations um, really haven't undergone a thoughtful reevaluation of what they want to be to their visitors and their constituents who live there full time. And I think some of those antiquated zoning and city ordinance laws 
if they were thoughtfully reconsidered, given who we are today coming out of the pandemic, could actually spur economic development and solve some of our housing issues that would then greatly benefit each of our organizations in our individual towns. And now I'm the one that can't unmute. <laughs> George Cordes, you had something to add. Yes, uh, I can actually speak to each of those three areas you, you mentioned. For example, connectivity, um, you know, we, the, the whole thing moving to streaming, you know, we want to get in the, in the habit of streaming our performances as well. But if you can't rely on the Wi-Fi, you know, not cutting out periodically, that's, that's an issue. Uh, transportation is, is definitely an issue to Blue Mountain Lake. Um, I have had to, you know, schlep over to to pick somebody up on the bus, you know, sometimes down to Albany off the train or whatever. And uh, our, you know, our transportation into the Adirondacks is not what it could be. But uh, that being said, we have also um, our our new development director, Jean Marie Donahue, um, has has been really uh, great in terms of getting busing going from uh, different communities to bring people to the art center this past season to performances. So that's, that's something we can do um, as, as an arts organization. And so she's, she's really uh, done well with that. In terms of housing, we, we deal with that every year. I mean, we, we have our theater festival um, actors and directors that we bring in, we need housing for them. Uh, we have our performers that we bring in from elsewhere. We need housing and lodging for them, um, and and it's a it's kind of a it's a tough issue because you know we, you know Indian Lake, Blue Mountain Lake, like every community is dealing with STRs, and and you want those people to make income, you know, to to have an income with those properties, but it's very different from the way it used to be in terms of, you know, can can you uh, please. We're, we're bringing in these 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 wonderful performers. Can you please help us out by putting them up? And and that's that's not really something you can you know feel comfortable putting out there. I I don't want to take income away from people, you know, who have these properties. But as an arts center, we also rely on their generosity. And and so, you know, it's uh, it's it's a tough issue. But uh, I I I'm not sure we I see a lot of housing going up in in the near future in in Blue Mountain Lake, you know, to tell you the truth, so. Mitch, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Thanks, I double clicked on the, uh... <laughs> it was great what I just said there though, believe me. Um, I wanna relay a uh, comment and question uh, from one of our audience members uh, who has concerns about uh, the uh, access to classical music. He says, I would love to see more opportunities to attend as well as perform classical music other than in the summer. There's an audience out there. Last weekend, his group, the Trillium Chamber Players played a sold out concert at the Hand House in uh, Elizabethtown but they had to pay for the space, provide the refreshments, print the programs, and do all the publicity. Fortunately, the piano stayed in tune. Otherwise, they would have had to pay to tune it as well. Um, and I guess his point is, um, how much opportunity is there to, to put on programming in what we think of as the off-season? Well, I, I want to just say, uh, I think that must be Tim Mount. And yep, hi, yep. Tim. <laughs> um, so actually, I actually want to say we we actually had Trillium at the Art Center this past summer um, after we reopened um, and, and they were great and we did pay them. And so uh, we were I was very gratified to be able to do that. Um, you know, I can't speak to other organizations in that in that regard. We do also have quite a bit of classical. I mean, we had three other classical uh, music concerts and, and planned at least three more and, and probably more next season. So, um, yeah, we, we do what we can, but again, being a small art center, um, we, we want to keep, keep our, our offerings, uh, you know, on a wide spectrum. We also have you know, so many, I get so many uh, every day, so many, um, you know, e emails from, from different types of artists, we're, we're looking for a venue, looking for a place to now that we're out of COVID, you know, or not, whatever, but, um, you know, looking for a place to perform. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, you know, we're, I think we're all doing our best to give opportunities to as many, as many people as we can and, and uh, 
to as wide a, a variety of, of performance as we can. Fantastic. Uh, Ed Donnelly, you have a hand raised. Yeah, that I wanted to just reiterate uh, what Tupper Arts is currently doing is in the process of, of uh, purchasing the State Theater next to our building, which will, again, we're planning on uh, building a stage for live performances. So we're very hopeful that in the next few years, we will have a space for concerts uh, of all types. And we would love to have different groups come and, and put them on in this beautiful space once we have it renovated. So we are thinking ahead to that. We have our summer performance venue, but the uh, theater, in addition to cinema, we'll, we're hopeful that we will also be able to put on live performances for groups such as the one you're speaking of. It would be our goal for sure. Terrific. Uh, Natalie, Phil, you have a hand raised, and I believe Catherine Underhill has a hand raised as well. Uh, but let's go to Natalie first, and then on to you, Catherine. Yeah, I was just going to say we. I mean, we do programs primarily in the off season. We do. We don't do that many programs during the summer. Actually, we do, but not as many. Um, but one thing that I think that maybe sometimes people don't realize with a small organization is um, we know that there's an audience. Um, the The problem with doing a program in the winter is the heartbreaking thing. Like you have no control over the weather, so you're all this money and time and energy and everything you've got this gorgeous program and there's a snowstorm um and when you're small a hit like that can can really hurt um so you know i'm sure everyone does the same thing in the in in the deep winter months we either do online programming or we do things that we know are in a smaller you know like in Sarnac lake or like like the larger towns or something um, because it, it can be really brutal. Um, so we know that there are locals year round that are dying for, you know, cultural content year round. It's just the 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 impact of having to cancel something because of the weather um, can be actually quite difficult. And I just don't know if people realize um, what that does to your to your finances. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Catherine Underhill, you had uh, you had a comment about this. Yeah, I I I am still trying to find my way on this front. So, um, like George, I would say we try to uh, present a very wide spectrum of all kinds of music, all kinds of spoken word opportunities. And as I said, I want to go back to having more dance. I think View was a uh, more well known dance venue back in the day. But I would also say that as part of our strategic planning efforts, which are currently underway, we're trying to take the pulse of the region. And I, I have to say, as a new executive director, I don't have a good sense of what people are really, really wanting. What are they looking for and how much variability there is between our year round regional residents and the summer population. So we have traditionally had a much more robust performance schedule in the summer and we draw a pretty good audience. You know, as I said, my, we have a 200 seat space. Uh, we can bump that up a little bit with some alternative seating opportunities. And in the winter time, you know, some of the folks on my team have said, oh, well, nobody will come because, you know, weather, as Natalie said, or we're not presenting what they want to hear. So I'm just, I'm sort of uh, swimming in the deep end of the pool on this. And I would be, I am very open to having chamber music, love chamber music. We're also having bluegrass and we're also having solo piano. And we just had Tapestry, which is an acapella group this past weekend. Um, uh, they came up from Hamilton College. So, you know, Part of it is marketing and part of it is understanding who we're trying to market to. So I'm open to suggestion. Let me say that. Uh, James Lemons, uh, what are, what's your thinking along those lines? Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, 
and I'm going to make an assumption here, and, and I may be wrong, so please completely forgive me. And Tim, forgive me if I get this wrong, but I think what's underlying a little bit of that question is what are the performance opportunities for local artists? Right. Not only from a, perhaps a classical music standpoint, but for a visual arts, we, we have a ton of amazing artists um, who are always needing to share with audiences what they do, uh, and sometimes limited opportunities to do so. Um, and I think that that for local artists looking for the opportunities to perform, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think Natalie's right, realizing that the particular institution you're reaching out to for performance opportunities does have financial liabilities that are broad and different and different for each and every one of us. Um, and the other thing is to give some thought, I think for, for all local artists, when you're reaching out, give some thought to what success means to you in that performance opportunity. You know, I will tell you that 50 people in my venue feels like a failure, no matter what your expectation is, just because the size of the hall is bigger than other places. And so 50 people doesn't feel full. The connection with the audience isn't it's really difficult with unless you get to that 125 mark in the house. And so, you know, I think that when you're inquiring about performance opportunities, you know, give some thought to what your expectation is and help communicate that because I know if you're cool with 20 people and it's going to feel like an empty room, um, but you're just wanting to get out there and get some get, get an opportunity, that changes the framing with which I'm evaluating what you're looking for and how I might be able to help you as opposed to, I really need a 75% house. Um, and realizing that for many of us, Opening the doors and turning the lights on for an audience costs me $1,200 no matter what. So I think, you know, understanding that there are liabilities that, that we are navigating as well, even though we want to help. Fantastic. We have a couple questions from our audience that I want to get to. Uh, and one of them is from Victoria, who asks, how much engagement do you all do with arts programs at local colleges in the region? Are there programs or opportunities for studying artists at your organizations? Uh, and I, I can, will start with uh, George. I can speak to that. I mean, in terms of our theater festival for the past uh, several years, uh, we have brought down um, performers uh, and, and, and been involved with the theater uh, department up at SUNY Plattsburgh. Um, we've got some great local contacts who actually teach up there, part of our local theater scene. And so we've been, for the past several years, we've, we've included students from SUNY Plattsburgh, the, the theater program. Um, we also, I've, you know, have, have reached out periodically to uh, SUNY Potsdam. Um, and you know it 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 can be, and I know one year we did bring some some people up from New York, uh, from uh, like um, was it uh, CUNY and and um, I think one Juilliard person. Um, you know it's it, it's great to make those connections, and it's something we tr we try to do as much as possible. Obviously, Tony's program is is all about making connections with at least students from various colleges all over the place, right? So, um, and, and so we, we do what we can. In terms of, it sounds like the question is also about um, having, um, you know, students come down and, and be able to be part of our, part of what we do at the Arts Center. We are, we've uh, been trying to get back to where we can be bringing in interns and, and do internships. And, and that's definitely going to be a big part of what we want to do next year as well. And that will, you know, that involves reaching out. We've, we've reached out to places like Le Moyne down in Syracuse and, and other places that have um, arts administration um, uh, programs, that kind of thing. So, you know, we're, we're trying to do more with that. Uh, at the risk of opening an entirely different can of worms, uh, talk about philanthropy. What are the challenges you see in widening the circle of people who support us all and who help make what we all do possible? Um, Ed Donnelly? Well, I was going to comment about the school, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump to this topic. Yeah, the, uh, the our donors are a big part, just like every 
organization that's here today. And if we compete with each other, it's, it's part of it is probably trying to get similar donors to support our organizations. And it's it's certainly vital when you're a nonprofit and it's a challenge and it's a, it's a continuous effort. Uh, we're in the process of raising money for, for further capital improvements and buying a theater. So it's, it is a challenge, but I've been amazed at the number of donors that are out there who are well off and very concerned and about our communities up here. Uh, they have their beautiful places on the lake, but they're also very interested in the health of the communities. And I've, that's one of the things that have surprised me since I've gotten involved with this organization is how many people out there are giving money when they find an organization that's proving they can spend the money you know, responsibly and improve the and re improve the community. They're out there, and we're all fighting for them. But uh, it's keeping us going, and I'm I'm hopeful it continues. Uh, Erica Blunt, you had something to uh, to add uh, regarding philanthropy. Yeah. Um. So I think one of the things, and obviously, as as we have dual homes, we're in a in a different position. Um, but one of the things that Tiffany made sure to was that a, a funder wanted to do a site visit and she made sure to bring them up here. And they were wondering, you know, why not Harlem? Why not the city? And it's like, you've been there. Like that's the work up here is very special. So um, she brought the International Association for Blacks and Dance um, and the National, uh, um, uh, the, excuse me, the nonprofit uh, finance fund uh the team that works with us up here and they're you know major funders for us as a nonprofit but also understanding what is up here and they fell in love immediately they didn't want to leave you know there there's lots of things and I think you know one of the things that you know leveraging our position you know they they asked like would we could we hold a conference here like could we do you know like what are the different things and like being able to bring um people who are not familiar with the Adirondacks and seeing the beauty of it um and then also I'm on the um, board for John Brown Lives and I think one of the things that uh, I've been noticing is that we're I think some and I know everyone has different operating budgets but the power of uh consistent like micro funding um you know and supporters and and what that means like we're the power is in the people. Yes, we need large funders. Yes, we need, um, you know, big donations. I'm not underestimating that. It costs a lot to be an arts organization, but I think having people both invested um, financially, but also feeling like, oh, I contribute to my community. And I support this studio, this arts organization, all of those things. I think that's really important. Um, to to just keeping keeping the arts uh, as part of people's day to day. Very good. We we just got another question that uh, I guess I'd like to uh, to direct to whoever feels most comfortable answering. Uh, someone uh, emailed us or uh, messaged us uh, who is planning to move to the region this winter and is asking, as a person who has been involved in the arts all of her life, uh, how does one get involved in the off season? And does the marketing of the arts get as segmented as the region seems to be to an outsider, like the general Adirondacks versus North versus Center versus South or Tri Lakes or wherever? Um, how much of an issue is that segmentation? But I think more to the point, uh, what would you recommend to someone who may well just be moving to the area and would like to get her feet wet in the arts community here? I, I would just say it depends on what area of the arts uh, she's involved in. Um, you know, if it's performance, there are, are various organizations. Uh, during the off season, I can't speak to that because that's, uh, you know, um, I, th I think that but but if it's you know visual arts, um, you know there there are obviously different uh, opportunities to 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 be uh, you know mostly during during the season, 
but uh, it's, you know, there are things like, like plein air festivals and, and we have, we actually, we just opened our call for artists for 2023 at the Arts Center. So we are looking for submissions for, for gallery shows in 2023. Um, you know, and, and uh, there's this community theater, there are choral groups, uh, which are all, I was gonna mention, they're all coming back now. In fact, we have our Messiah Singh, uh, coming, our Tri Lakes Messiah Singh coming back uh, next weekend. So, uh, you know, and anybody who wants to sing the Messiah, come and join us next Sunday at, at three in Saranac Lake. Um, you know, there are just, just, you just have to kind of reach out and depend, you know, it depends on what, what type of the art, you know, what area of the arts you're interested in. Well, and it seems like uh, the organizations that are represented on this panel here this evening are all intimate enough that one could write or email or some other way reach out and uh, and you'd be welcome to, uh, to play a role. Um, Tony Kostecki, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was just gonna say as a, to answer that person's question, um, I think all of our towns have pretty, pretty great uh, chambers of commerces that have lots of information. Um, you can always reach out to Roost. They have a lot of information about all the organizations in the area as well. Um, and I'll put, a, I'll put a plug in for a new kind of a calendar, <laughs> but it's new, <laughs> new email, um, uh, email newsletter. Out of, it's coming out of uh, J actually, but it's Adirondack Arts and Entertainment. And they're doing a really great job of getting word out about all kinds of opportunities across the Adirondacks. So that's another uh, another resource. Uh, fantastic. We had a number of questions that we could not quite get to that came in over the Q and A, uh, but hopefully. Um, uh, hopefully Cheryl and the folks at the Adirondack Experience can forward some questions to people who uh, who might be best suited to answer them. But at this point, I want to thank all of you for uh, for fielding my questions, and I'm going to turn things back over to David Kahn. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mitch, and all of our panelists. Um, I'm not sure you can quite see me yet, but that's okay. I'm I'm uh, I'm here in spirit, if if in no other way, and. And George, I just want to mention, you probably don't want me singing the Messiah, um, but I think it's probably going to be a, a great program. Um, tonight's program will be recorded or has been recorded, and it will be available on the Adirondack Experiences website in just a couple of days. Our next Artists and Inspiration Zoom program will take place on Monday, January 23rd at the same time at 7 o'clock at night, and it will feature Todd DiGiarmo, We'll discuss everyday objects such as quilts and baskets that are found in the collections of the Adirondack Experience, as well as the collection of the Folklife Center at the Crandall Library in Glens Falls. Todd is the founding director there. Information about that program and registration is posted in the chat. And for those, excuse me just a sec. And for those of you who are looking for a spirit evening, spirited evening of libations, please check out our Adirondack Experience org, uh, Adirondack ADKX.org events page, and there you'll find information about our upcoming taps and trivia takeovers at breweries throughout the Adirondacks. That's taps and trivia takeovers. We'll be at the Lake Placid Brewery this Wednesday, and we'll be in breweries around Glens Falls in January. And lastly, if you haven't quite finished your holiday shopping, please stop by the Adirondack Experience shop this Friday and Saturday, December 16th and 17th from 10 to 4. It will be open and there's even a gift wrapping center there for free. Um, I've used it. It's great. So we wish all of you a wonderful and uh, happy holiday season and a healthy new year. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, every Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.